Right now, Iran is undergoing an incredibly significant, you know, protest uh, that started with the police murder of a Kurdish woman for religious indecency. Uh, this has turned into an anti-hijab protest, of course. The religious police in Iran, uh, uh, you, you know, we, we, we've been over all that, but right now it's a big protest, a huge deal. It's been, uh, it's been very wacky, very normal. Uh, we support the protesters, obviously. But I want to learn a little bit more. Iran is an incredibly old country. Uh, you know, there's a lot of history there. A lot of interesting stuff's happened. Uh, we've done a lot of meddling, you know? We've done a lot of wacky stuff. Let's, let's see. Iran, officially the Islamic Republic of Iran, and also called Persia, is a country in Western Asia, if you can believe it. What about, blah, 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 okay. I know a lot of this stuff. A population of 86 million, second largest country in the Middle East, Tehran, Mashhad, Isfahan, Tabraj, Shiraz, and Tabriz. Uh, the country is home to one of the world's oldest civilizations, beginning with the formation of the Elamite kingdoms in the 4th millennium BC, first unified by the Medes, an ancient Iranian people in the 7th century BC, and reaches territorial height in the 6th century BC, when Cyrus the Great founded the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which became one of the largest empires in history and a superpower. The Achaemenid Empire fell to Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC and was subsequently divided into several Hellenistic states. An Iranian rebellion established the Parthian Empire in the 3rd century BC, which was succeeded in the 3rd century AD by the Sassanid Empire, a major world power for the next four centuries. Arab Muslims conquered the empire in the 7th century AD, which led to the Islamicization of Iran. It subsequently became a major center of Islamic culture and learning with its art, literature, philosophy, and architecture spreading across the Muslim world and be uh, beyond during the Islamic Golden Age. Over the next two centuries, a series of native Iranian Muslim dynasties emerged before the Siljuk Turks and the Mongols conquered the region. In the 15th century, the native Safavids re-established a unified Iranian state and national identity and converted the country to Shia Islam. Under the reign of Nadir Shah in the 18th century, Iran, oh, Iran presided over the most powerful military in the world. Though by the 19th century, a series of conflicts with the Russian Empire led to significant territorial losses. The early, uh, the early 20th century saw the Persian Constitutional Revolution. Efforts to nationalize its fossil fuel supply from Western countries led to an Anglo-American coup in 1953, which resulted in greater autocratic rule under Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and growing Western political influence. He went on to launch a far-reaching series of reforms in 1963. After the Iranian Revolution, the current Islamic Republic was established in 1979 by Ruhollah Khomeini, who became the country's first supreme leader. The government of Iran is an Islamic theocracy that includes some elements of a presidential system, with the ultimate authority vested in an autocratic supreme leader, a position held by Ali Khomeini since Khomeini's death, in 1989. The Iranian government is authoritarian and has attracted widespread criticism for its significant constraints and abuses against human rights and civil liberties, including several violent suppressions of mass protests, unfair elections, and limited rights for women and for children. It is also a focal point for Shia Islam within the Middle East, countering the long-existing Arab and Sunni hegemony within the region. Since the Iranian Revolution, the country is widely considered to be the largest adversary of Israel and also of Saudi Arabia. Iran is also considered to be one of the biggest players within Middle Eastern affairs, with its government being involved both directly and indirectly in the majority of modern Middle Eastern conflicts. Iran is a regional and middle power with a geopolitically strategic location in the Asian continent. It is a founding member of the United Nations, the ECO, the OIC, and OPEC. It has large reserves of fossil fuels, including the second largest natural gas supply and the fourth largest proven oil reserve. The country's rich cultural legacy is reflected in part by its 26 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Historically a multi-ethnic country, Iran remains a pluralistic society comprising numerous ethnic, linguistic, and religious groups, with the largest of these being the Persians, Azeris, Kurds, Mazadaranis, and Lurs. Now we learn. That was the summary. So, right. Okay. 
Uh, we're not here for etymology, I'm afraid. Prehistory. The earliest attested archaeological... Look into the most powerful army thing. We'll get to it. The earliest attested archaeological artifacts in Iran, like those excavated at Kashifrud and Ganjpar in North Iran, confirm a human presence since the Lower Paleolithic. Iran's Neanderthal artifacts from the Middle Paleolithic have been found mainly in the Zagros region at sites like Warwasi and Yefte. From the 10th to the 7th millennium BC, early agricultural communities began to flourish in and around the Zagros region in western Iran, including Sholha Golan, Sholha Bonut, and Sholha Mish. The occupation of grouped hamlets in the area of Susa, as determined by radiocarbon dating, ranges from a long time ago. There are dozens of prehistoric sites across the Iranian plateau pointing to the existence of ancient cultures and urban settlements in the 4th millennium BC. During the Bronze Age, the territory of present-day Iran was home to several civilizations, including Ilam, Tirof, and Zayandirud. Zayan Dirud. Ilam, the most prominent of these three civilizations, was developed in the southwest alongside those in Mesopotamia, and continued its existence until the emergence of the Iranian empires. The advent of writing in Ilam was paralleled to Sumer, and the Ilamite cuneiform was developed since the 3rd millennium BC. Alright, chat's offering me a lot of info, but I hope you understand that I can't simultaneously read Wikipedia and chat. Classical Antiquity by the second millennium BC, the ancient Iranian peoples arrived. Was now Iran the ancient step? Okay, let's try to fill into the dominion of the Assyrian Empire. Do, 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 do. Cyrus the Great took over the Median Empire and founded the Achaemenid Empire by unifying the other city states. The conquest of Media was the result of what was called the Persian Revolt. Unfortunately, the problem with ancient civilizations is that, uh, you know, there's a very, it's very difficult finding a nice starting point. Um, but let's at least go to the uh, A.D. times, if we can. Uh, in 334 B.C., Alexander the Great invaded the Achaemenid Empire, defeating the last Achaemenid emperor, Darius III, at the Battle of Issus. Following the premature death of Alexander, Iran came under the control of the Hellenistic Seleucid, Seleucid Empire. In the middle of the 2nd century B.C., the Parthian Empire rose to become the main power in Iran, and the century-long geopolitical arch rivalry between the Romans and the Parthians began, culminating in the Roman-Parthian Wars. The Parthian Empire continued as a feudal monarchy for nearly five centuries until 224 CE, when it was succeeded by the Sasanian Empire. Together with their neighboring arch rival, the Roman Byzantines, they made up the world's two most dominant powers at the time for over four centuries. Hoo-hoo, 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 hoo-hoo. A lot of stuff happened, but let's, uh, we haven't even reached Islam yet, you know? The prolonged byzantine sasanian Wars, most importantly the Climatic War of 602 to 628, as well as the social conflict within the Sasanian Empire, opened the way for an Arab invasion of Iran in the 7th century. The empire was initially defeated by the Reshidun Caliphate, which was succeeded by the Umayyad Caliphate, followed by the Abbasid Caliphate. A prolonged and gradual process of state-imposed Islamicization followed which targeted Iran's then Zoroastrian majority and included religious persecution, demolition of libraries, and fire temples, a special tax penalty, and language shift. In 750, the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads. Arab Muslims and Persians of all strata made up the rebel army, which was united by the converted Persian Muslim Abu Muslim. Ah, of course! Abu Muslim Abd al-Rahman ibn Muslim al-Khurasani, or, of course, Bezadan pur Vandad Hormozd, as he's known to his friends. Having a guy whose name is shortened to Abu Muslim is very confusing. Okay. In their struggle for power, the society in their times gradually became cosmopolitan, and the old Arab simplicity and aristocratic dignity, bearing and prestige, were lost. That's a strangely narrativized sentence. That feels a little... Persians and Turks began to replace the Arabs in most fields. Uh, the fusion of the Arab nobility with the subject races, the practice of polygamy and concubinage, made for a social amalgam wherein loyalties became uncertain and a hierarchy of officials emerged, a bureaucracy at first Persian and later Turkish, which decreased Abbasid prestige and power for good. This feels a bit loaded. This section comes across 
a little less impartial check the source. No, I'm not concerned with the source. I'm concerned with the way the source is summarized in this paragraph. So this is, you, you know, you know how before I've talked about how being good at self-education isn't about the sources that you find. It's about how to interpret what you see. This is what I mean. Looking, looking at a, a passage and learning to get a feel for if something feels like a bit biased or like a little loaded, like there was a narrative being put into it, you know? There always is a narrative, of course, but you know, you, you, getting a feel for that can be really important. Check the edit history. I don't want to get in that deep. I don't want to get in that deep. After two centuries of Arab rule, semi-independent and independent Iranian kingdoms, including the Ahirids, Safarids, Samanids, and Buyids, began to appear on the fringes of the declining Abbasid Caliphate. The blossoming literature, philosophy, mathematics, medicine, astronomy, and art of Iran became major elements in the formation of a new age for the Iranian civilization, a period known as the Islamic Golden Age. So this is one of those things that if, like, the fact that a lot of Westerners don't get taught about this in school is kind of really fucked. This was one of the, like, this was one of the, like, main periods of humans. Like, th this was one of the, like, big human things. Uh, it was a big deal. I never learned about this till university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't really get taught, you know? Let's learn about the Islamic Golden Age. It's a really big subject. Is there, like, a nice summary? Here. Like, let's just really quickly, okay? Hold on. Religious influence. Um, the various Quranic injunctions and hadith, which placed values on education and emphasis on the importance of acquiring knowledge, played a vital role in influencing the Muslims of this age in their search for knowledge and the development of the body of science. The Islamic Empire heavily patronized scholars because they were chads. The money spent on the translation movement for some translations is estimated to be equivalent to about twice the annual research budget of the United Kingdom's Medical Research Council. The best scholars and notable translators, such as Hunayn ibn um, Ishaq, had salaries that are estimated to be the equivalent of professional athletes today. The House of Wisdom was a library established in Abbasid era Baghdad, Iraq, by Caliph al-Mansur in 825, modeled after the Academy of Jundi Shapur. During this period, Muslims showed a strong interest in assimilating the scientific knowledge of the civilizations that had been conquered. Many classical works of antiquity that might otherwise have been lost were translated from Greek, Syriac, Middle Persian, and Sanskrit into Syriac and Arabic, some of which were later turned into other languages like Hebrew and Latin. Christians, especially adherents of the Church of the East, the Nestorians, contributed to Islamic civilization during the reign of the Umayyads and the Abbasids by translating works of Greek philosophers and ancient science to Syriac and afterwards to Arabic. They also excelled in many fields, in particular philosophy, uh, science, such as Hunayn ibn Ishaq, Yusuf al-Khuri, al-Himsi, Kusta ibn Luka, um, Masawai, Patriarch Eutychus, and Jabril ibn Buktishu, and theology. For a long time, the personal physicians of the Abbasid caliphs were often Assyrian Christians. Among the most prominent Christian families to serve as physicians to the caliphs were the Buktishu dynasty. Throughout the 4th to 7th centuries, Christian scholarly work in the Greek and Syriac languages was either newly translated or had been preserved since the Hellenistic period. Among the prominent centers of learning and transmission of classical wisdom were Christian colleges such as the School of Nisibis and the School of Edessa, the pagan center of learning in Haran, and the renowned hospital and medical academy of Gandhi Shapur, which was the intellectual, theological, and scientific center of the Church of the East. Many scholars of the House of Wisdom were of Christian background, and it was led by Christian physician Hunayn ibn Ishaq with the support of Byzantine medicine. Uh, many of the most important philosophical and scientific works of the ancient world were translated, including the works of Galen, Hippocrates, Plato, Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Archimedes. So the, the Islamic Golden Age is the only reason we have a ton of information on the Middle Ages, the Roman Empire, and the ancient Greeks because a lot of this shit would have been lost, but it got brought over here and it got translated in like 15 different languages and preserved. A ton of the stuff, all of the knowledge that we have on the, uh, the ancient world only exists today because it, was, it, it survived through the, um, 
the records that were 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 you know uh, uh uh brought together during the Islamic golden age and then the mongols burned it down yes well the mongols will burn some stuff down but this is the reason why we got a, like a lot of stuff that's not the only reason i didn't say it was the only reason persians were all also were a notably high proportion of scientists who contributed to the islamic golden age uh, according to Bernard Lewis, culturally, politically, and most remarkably of all, even religiously, the Persian contribution to this new Islamic civilization is of immense importance. The work of Iranians can be seen in every field of cultural endeavor, including Arabic poetry, to which poets of Iranian origin composed their poems in Arabic, made a very significant contribution. While cultural influence used to radiate outwards from Baghdad, after the Mongol destruction of the Abbasid Caliphate, Arab influence decreased. Iran and Central Asia, benefiting from increased cross-cultural access to East Asia under Mongol rule, flourished and developed more distinctly or distinctively from Arab influence, such as the Timurid Renaissance under the Timurid dynasty. With a new and easier writing system and the introduction of paper, oh yeah, thank them for that, information was democratized to the extent that, for probably the first time in history, it became possible to make a living only from writing and selling books. The use of paper spread from China into Muslims regions. Uh, in the 8th century through mass productions in Samarkand and Khorasan, arriving in Al-Andalus on the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal, in the 10th century. It was easier to manufacture than parchment, less likely to crack than papyrus, and could absorb ink, making it difficult to erase and ideal for keeping records. Islamic papermakers devised assembly line methods of hand-copying manuscripts uh, to turn out editions far larger than any available in Europe for centuries. It was from these countries the rest of the world learned to make paper from linen. Wait, didn't China invent paper? Yeah, it just said that. I mean, like, we got it from the Muslims, though. Like, for hundreds of years, it was there. What? There are some people in China, I look over, and they seem to keep, like, second-guessing the contributions of the Islamic gold. Do we have an agenda over here? Wait, Happy Nader, what are you going on about? What is this? Yeah, totally. Caliphates never do anything horrible. What the fuck is wrong with some people in chat? Almost like the Mongolians didn't destroy everything, a eh, Vosh? What do you... What has happened? Do we have any, like, ancient... Ancient rivalries? What's happening? Your chat says, let's go back to the Caliphate, Vosh? Yeah, obviously. Praise Allah. Um, okay. Byzantines in chat, seething. Uh, Byzantine cells, seething and coping in the face of the... <laughs> Iranian, uh, uh, it's a golden age of Islam chats. Basically, like, as I understand, it, like, look, this thing goes on for a while. Like, all the mathematics, significant development in algebra, arithmetic, and Hindu Arabic numerals. This guy is considered the father of algebra, uh, credited with identifying the foundations of analytic geometry, found the general geometric solution of the cubic equation. His book, Treatise on Demonstrations of Problems of Algebra, 1070, which laid down the principles of algebra, is part of the body of Persian mathematics that was eventually transmitted to Europe. In a bunch of, like, this like th this was literally, like, the apex of scientific development at the time by a massive, massive margin. Um, trigonometry, uh, uh, um, calculus. Alhazen discovered the sum formula for the fourth power. I don't even fucking know what that means. Um, natural sciences. Even Al-Haytham was a significant figure in the history of the scientific method. Um, and has been described as the world's first true scientist. Avicenna made rules for testing the effectiveness of drugs, including the effect produced by the experimental drug should be seen constantly after many repetitions to be counted. Keep in mind that at this time, like, Europeans are curing their diseases by, like, portioning out how much dirt mud they should eat. Um, at the time, they're like, um, they're like, okay, you've got a rash on your bum. That's uh, three cups of dirt mud. Mix it in. You know, um, astronomy this is a huge section. One of the largest advances in Islamic astronomy was the rejection of the Ptolemaic system of the planets. The system developed by Ptolemy, uh, uh, Ptol Ptolemy placed the sun, moon, and other planets in orbit around the Earth. Ptolemy thought the planets moved on circles called epicycles, and their centers rode on deference. The deference were eccentric, and the angular motion of the planet was uniform around the equant, which was a point opposite the deferent center. Simply put, Ptolemy's models were a mathematical system for predicting the positions of the planets. And then they argued about it, because they're nerds, yeah. Alhazen played a role in the development of optics. Uh, oh, this is the thing you guys care so much about. 
Al Biruni wrote his insights into light, stating its velocity must be immense when compared to the speed of sound. Holy shit! Al Hazen correctly argued that vision occurred when light traveling in straight lines reflected off an object into the eyes. A thousand years ago? He figured out how, how optics worked and, and, and correctly determined that there was a speed of light rather than it just being like a natural feature of the universe. That is an insane thing to figure out back then. Jesus Christ. Biology. You know, first scholar to contradict the convention of the Galen school that blood could pass between the ventricles of the heart. He also stated there must be small communications or pores between the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, a prediction that preceded the discovery of the pulmonary capillaries uh, of Marcello Malfighi by 400 years, classifying the nervous system. They figured out evolution? Modern commenters have likened medieval accounts of the struggle for existence in the animal kingdom to the framework of the theory of evolution. Thus, in his survey of the history of the ideas which led to the theory of natural selection, Conway Zirkel noted that al jahiz was one of those who discovered a struggle for existence in his Kitab al Hayawan, Book of Animals, written in the 9th century. In the 13th century, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi believed that humans were de derived from advanced animals, saying such humans, probably anthropoid apes, live in the western Sudan in distant corners of the world. They are close to animals by their habits, deeds, and behavior. In 1377, even Khaldun in his Mukadima stated, the animal kingdom was developed, its species multiplied, in the gradual process of creation it ended in man arising from the world of the monkeys. Holy shit, dude. 14th century. The, anyway, like, the reason that I'm going through all this, this is, this is another one of those, like, the preconceptions we have, right? When people think of the, like, historical Muslim world, I think a lot of people, like, know about the golden age of Islam, but it's important to understand not only were they, like, really advanced for their time, they, like, they, it was, like, in terms of, like, philosophy and science, it could be easily likened to the ancient Greeks or to, um, or, or to, like, the Roman Empire. Like, or, or, and in some senses exceeded them as well. Being the birth of like optics, evolution theory, uh, uh, several forms of mathematics, and like uh, uh, fuck, you know, fucking um, shit like that. I mean, we're talking like an insane height um, of civilizational development, and a lot of it just just doesn't um, get like taught, right? Um, we 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 learn about the uh, the Renaissance, and a lot of people treat the Renaissance like it's like you know, oh yeah. Like we finally figured out how to do science, and we we got out of the dark ages and stuff. But like, while 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 Europe was still um, centuries away from the Enlightenment, all this shit was going on, and we just don't learn that much about it. And I don't know that much about it. But they figured out a lot of stuff back then. They also had big developments in formal logic, notably temporal and modal logic. European logicians didn't even get to that until they were like the 1900s. Yeah. Yeah, India and China also had massive civilizational booms. Vosh, don't be mad, but this is very generalizing. Yeah, of course. We're going over, like, thousands of years of history, of course. But the, the, the broader statements that I'm making here are completely true. Uh, this is a largely overlooked, like, historical period in Western education circles, and they did some incredible shit. They developed and learned a bunch of stuff that we did not develop and learn, like, really, really, really far along. Like, really far along. Like... 13th century, we must have come from monkeys far along. Holy shit. And they uh, translated and preserved a ton of stuff that we, um, that we now cite when we're, when we're referring to like ancient Greece and stuff. Healthcare. The typical hospital was divided into departments such as... Do you know what, do you know what hospitals looked like in Europe in 805? The typical hospital was divided into departments such as systemic diseases, surgery, and orthopedics, with larger hospitals having more diverse specialties. Systemic diseases was the rough equivalent of today's internal medicine, as was divided into sections such as fever, infections, and digestive issues. Every department had an officer in charge, a presiding officer, and a supervising specialist. The hospital also had lecture theaters and libraries. 
Hospital staff included sanitary inspectors who regulated cleanliness and accountants and other administrative staff. The hospitals were typically run by a three-man board comprised of a non-medical administrator, the chief pharmacist called the Sheikh Saeed Dalani, who was equal in rank to the chief physician, who served as Mutwali, or the dean. Medical facilities traditionally closed each night, but by the 10th century, laws were passed to keep hospitals open 24-7. For less serious cases, physicians staffed outpatient clinics. Cities also had first aid centers staffed by physicians for emergencies that were often located in busy public places, such as big gatherings for Friday prayers. I need you guys to understand that this is better than the standard of care in like 1800s Europe. In the American, in, in America, after the, the Revolutionary War, hospitals were like disease pits where court orders were used to throw the sick into, and they had no anesthesia, and they would fucking cut. Until germ theory, like, they were disgusting fucking shit pits. Yeah, even, to, like, like people, hospitals were where you went to die. The wealthy, back in um, post-Revolutionary War America, wealthy Americans, like, like noblemen and, like, business owners, would not go to hospitals when they were sick. Why do you think that wealthy people back then would be in their home beds? You know why? Because hospitals were places they sent sick people to contain contagion. They were places you went to die. You went there and you either lived or you died away from other people. Wealthy people would get private doctors at their own abodes because nobody wanted to go to a hospital. The region also had mobile units staffed by doctors and pharmacists who were supposed to meet the need of remote communities. Baghdad was also known to have a separate hospital for convicts since the early 20th, uh, sorry, early 10th century after the vizier Ali ibn Issa ibn Jarrah ibn Thabit, that's four generations, wrote to Baghdad's chief medical officer that prisons must have their own doctors who should examine them every day. This is better than what we have fucking today. The idea in the 10th century of a prison doctor to make sure prisoners are kept healthy, this is insane back then. This is like, Ins insane standard of care for the time. For today, even, this, this, is, this would be considered progressive. The first hospital built in Egypt in Cairo's southwestern quarter was the first documented facility to care for mental illnesses. In Aleppo's Argonne Hospital, care for mental illness included abundant light, fresh air, running water, and music. The West wouldn't figure this out. The, Ro the West still hasn't figured this out. Our mental health facilities are cramped boxes where people listen to ticking clocks on the wall um, while, while they wait for pharmacy prescriptions. We've rejected the idea of like, hey, maybe a, like a place that's pretty and quiet with like chill music might be a good like facilitator. Nope, you got to drive to a fucking parking lot to meet your therapist. Medical students would accompany physicians and participate in patient care. Hospitals in this era were the first to require medical diplomas to license doctors. Um... The licensing test was administered by the region's government-appointed chief medical officer. The test had two steps. The first was to write a treatise on the subject of the candidate wished to obtain a certificate of original research or commentary on existing texts, which they were encouraged to scrutinize for errors. The second step was to answer questions in a review. By the way, this is peer review right here. This is peer review. The second step was to answer questions in an interview with the chief medical officer. Physicians worked fixed hours with medical staff salaries, which were fixed by law. For regulating the quality of care and arbitrating cases, it is related that if a patient dies, their family presents the doctor's prescriptions to the chief physician, who would judge if the death was natural or by negligence, in which case the family would be entitled to compensation from the doctor. The hospitals had male and female quarters, while some hospitals only saw men and other hospitals staffed by women physicians only saw women. While women physicians practiced medicine, Many largely focused on ob obstetrics, yeah, like pregnancy and childbirth. Hospitals were forbidden by law to turn away patients who were unable to pay. Eventually, charitable foundations called WACFs wakfs, wakfs, were formed to support hospitals as well as schools. Part of the state budget also went towards maintaining hospitals. While the services of the hospital were free to all citizens, and patients were sometimes given a small stipend to support recovery upon discharge, this is literally more progressive than any medical system on earth today. It wasn't just free, they would support you, they would li fucking pay you out. Individual physicians occasionally charge fees. In a notable endowment, a 13th century governor of Egypt, Al-Mashur Kalawun, 
ordained a foundation for the Kalawan Hospital that would contain a mosque and a chapel, separate wards for different diseases, a library for doctors, and a pharmacy. And the hospital is used today for ophthalmology. The Kalawan Hospital was based in a former Fatimid palace which had accommodations for 8,000 people. It served 4,000 people daily. The Wax stated, The hospital shall keep all patients, men and women, are to, until they are completely recovered. All costs are to be borne by the hospital, whether the people come from afar or near, whether they are residents or foreigners, strong or weak, low or high, rich or poor, employed or unemployed, blind or sighted, physically or mentally ill, learned or illiterate. There are no conditions of consideration and payment. None is objected to or even indirectly hinted at for non-payment. This is what I mean. Like, th like this is the shit... We, we like sneer at the Muslim world, but for hundreds of years, they achieved levels of social progress, in some senses, not all, that outpaced what we have today. Literally. This isn't like even taken for granted today. Can you imagine an American politician saying this? Free medical care, no matter where you come from, aka whether you're a citizen or not? Absolutely not. This is just... Tech limitations, though, my, my, my objective here is not to dishonestly argue that the golden age of Islam was perfect. It wasn't. But do you recognize that this is not only impressive for the time, this is like unparalleled in human history. This, is, this isn't just impressive for the time. This is an apex of development with ideological and like social tendencies that are unrivaled in humanity. It goes beyond like they were advanced for their time. Again, I am not making the argument that it was perfect or flawless or that there weren't problems. Of course there were. But goddamn. Pharmacies, medicine, we could go on for a long time. Al-Zarari was a 10th century Arab physician. He is sometimes referred to as the father of surgery. The first mastectomy to treat breast cancer. Oh, oh, no. 10th century. It's not TOS, we're fine. Current research has led to the conclusion that the available evidence is consistent with the hypothesis that an increase in the political power of the elites caused the observed decline in scientific output. The decline could be part of a larger trend where the non-Western world fell behind the West in the Great Divergence. In 1208, Oh, sorry, 1206, Genghis Khan established the Mongol Empire, which during the 13th century conquered most of the Eurasian landmass, including China in the east and much of the old Islamic Caliphate in the west. The destruction of Baghdad and the House of Wisdom by Kulagu Khan in 1258 has been seen by some as the end of the Islamic Golden Age. However, while cultural influence used to radiate outwards from Baghdad, after the fall of Baghdad, Iran and Central Asia saw a flourish, uh, cultural flourishing by benefiting from increased cost cross-cultural access. So, you know. Anyway, do we now have a sufficient appreciation for the, uh, the, the historical contributions of peoples who are not generally taught about? I mean, you can read all of this. It's uh, so impressive. Do China next? Well, we're doing this right now. Ibn Khaldun is regarded to be uh, among the founding fathers of modern sociology. Hey, rep. I just got from that that I hate the Mongols. Yeah, fair. God damn, man. The sulfur-mercury theory of metals first attested in Pseudo-Apollonius Tiena's Sir al Kalika, The Secret of Creation, 750-850. The Arabic writings remain the basis, would remain the basis of all theories of metallic composition until the 18th century. Imagine writing a treatise on chemistry so influential that it leads, for a thousand years, it remains the, the textbook Ah, uh, true, Sartre. Significant examples from the medieval Islamic world include the synthesis of ammonium chloride from organic substances, as described in the works attributed to Jabir, and Abu Bakr al Razi's experiments with vitriol, which would eventually lead to the discovery of mineral acids like sulfuric and nitric acids by 13th century Latin alchemists such as Pseudo Geber. Jesus. Sorry, it's just, uh, it, they just did a lot, you know? Uh, they did a lot. In a lot of ways, they were also quite. Um, socially progressive i think obviously not what we would consider socially progressive by modern standards but i think in in a lot of ways i mean they you know they were very multicultural uh and you know honored the contributions of christians multiculturalism is great blah blah, blah. islam ruined this progress what 
This is the Islamic golden age. Islam didn't ruin this progress. It was this progress. This is th These were Muslims. No, I mean current religious leaders don't invest in this. Well, let's find out why. The cultural revival that began in the Abbasid period led to a resurfacing of the Iranian national identity, thus the attempts of Arabization never succeeded in Iran. Uh, independence from Arab invaders, 10th century monsters. Let's get to the end of the Islamic uh, Golden Age. Here. Under the Khwarazmian Empire, Iran suffered a devastating invasion by the Mongol Empire army of Genghis Khan. According to Stephen R. Ward, Mongol violence and depredations killed up to three-fourths of the population of the Iranian plateau, possibly 10 to 15 million people. Some historians have estimated that Iran's population did not again reach its pre-Mongol levels until the mid-20th century. Most modern historians either outright dismiss or are highly skeptical of such statistics of colossal magnitude pertaining the Mongol onslaught of the Khwarazmian Empire, mainland Iran, the other Muslim regions, and deem them to be exaggerations by Muslim chroniclers of the era, whose recordings were naturally of an anti-Mongol bent. Indeed, as far as the Iranian plateau is concerned, the bulk of the Mongol onslaught and battles in the northeast of what is modern Iran, such as the cities of Nishapur and Tus. Well, then what estimate do you believe in? Following the fracture of the, fracture of the Mongol Empire, uh, Kulagu Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, established the Ilkhanate in Iran. In 1370, yet another conqueror, Timur, followed the example of Kulagu, established the Timurid Empire, which lasted for another 156 years. In 1387, Timur ordered the complete massacre of Isfahan, reportedly killing 70,000 civilians. The Ikans and Timurids soon came to adopt the ways and customs of the Iranians, surrounding themselves with a culture that was distinctly Iranian. By the 1500s, Ishmael I of Ardabil established the Safavid Empire with his capital at Tabriz. Beginning with Azerbaijan, he subsequently extended his authority over all the Iranian territories and established an intermittent Iranian hegemony over the vast relative regions, reasserting the Iranian identity within larger parts of Greater Iran. How big is Greater Iran? Big. Greater Iran is big. All the way to, from, Chi from China to Turkey. Wow. Iran was predominantly Sunni, but Ishmael instigated a forced conversion to the Shia branch of Islam, spreading throughout the Safavid territories in the Caucasus, Iran, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia. As a result, modern-day Iran is the only official Shia nation in the world, with it holding an absolute majority in Iran and the Republic of Azerbaijan, having their first... That's interesting! But Iran supports Armenia against Azerbaijan, doesn't it? Despite Azerbaijan being the only other... That is interesting. It's their only Shia brother. And they're supporting Armenia again. Sorry, okay, sorry. Just having their the first and second highest number of Shia inhabitants by population percentage in the world. Meanwhile, the centuries-long geopolitical and ideological rivalry between Safavid Iran and the neighboring Ottoman Empire led to numerous Ottoman-Iranian wars. Ah, uh, Iran has an Azerbaijani minority in Iran that causes problem for them. Gotcha, gotcha. The Safavid era peaked in the reign of Abbas I, surpassing the Turkish arch-rivals in strength, mating, making Iran a leading science and art hub in western Eurasia. The Safavid era saw the start of mass integration from Caucasian populations into new layers of the society of Iran, as well as mass resettlement of them within the heartlands of Iran, playing a pivotal role in the history of Iran for centuries outward. Following a gradual decline in the late 1600s or early 1700s, the continuous war with the Ottoman foreign interference, most notably from Russians, the Safavid rule was ended by the Pashtun rebels who besieged um, Isfahan and defeated Sultan Hussein, Hussein in 1722. Chieftain drove out the invaders. Okay, this is a lot of military shit right here. Hold on. Okay, a lot of military. A lot of people winning and then subsequently losing to another person who then wins but then loses. Okay, let's... Uh, a, a number of people fought. Many people fought. <laughs> The Russo-Iranian Wars of 1804 to 1813 and 1826 to 1828 resulted in large, irrevocable territorial losses for Iran in the Caucasus, comprising all of Southern Caucasus and Dagestan, which made part of the very concept of Iran for centuries, and thus subsequent gains for the neighboring Russian Empire. 
As a result, the Russians took over the Caucasus and Iran irrevocably lost control over its integral territories in the region, comprising modern-day Dagestan, Georgia, Armenia, and the Republic of Azerbaijan, which got confirmed per the treaties of Gulistan and Turkmenche. The area of the North Azerbaijan River. As Iran shrank, many South Caucasian and North Caucasian Muslims moved toward Iran, especially until the aftermath. Guys, Caucasian here means the Caucasus, like Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, not like Caucasoids, especially until the aftermath of the Circian Genocide and the decades afterwards, about 1.5 million people, 20 to 25 percent of the population of Iran, died as a result of the Great Famine of 1870 to 1872. Between 1872 and 1905, a series of protests took place in response to the sale of concessions to foreigners by Qajar monarchs Nasir ed-Din and Mozaffar ed-Din, and led to the Constitutional Revolution in 1905. Okay, we're getting to like modern-ish history now. The first Iranian constitution and the first national parliament of Iran were founded in 1906 through the ongoing revolution. The constitution included the official recognition of Iran's three religious minorities, namely Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians, which has remained a basis in the legislation of Iran since then. The struggle related to the constitutional movement was followed by the triumph of Tehran in 1909, when Mohammad Ali Shah was defeated and forced to abdicate. On the pretext of restoring order, the Russians occupied northern Iran in 1911 and maintained a military presence in the region for years to come. But this did not put an end to the civil uprising, and was soon followed by Mirza Kushik Khan's jungle movement Jesus, against both the Qajar monarchy and the foreign invaders. Despite Iran's neutrality during World War I, the Ottoman, Russian, and British empires occupied the territory of western Iran and fought the Persian campaign before fully withdrawing their forces in 1921. At least two million Persian civilians died, either directly in the fighting, the Ottoman-perpetrated anti-Christian genocides, or the war-induced famine of 1917 to 1919. A large number of Iranian Assyrian and Iranian Armenian Christians as well as those Muslims who try to protect them. Does anyone else feel like Iran got kind of shafted here by being in the middle of the world map? Like, think about it. For basically all of, like, Afro-Eurasian, like, history, Iran is kind of at the middle. <laughs> They're kind of in the middle of, like, everything, which means that invariably... Like, they, they occupy, like, a, a central land route. Like, they're right fucking here. So, invariably, like, they're gonna get roped into a lot of shit. Yeah, should have should have chosen a more defensible territory, like fucking Great Britain or something, on an island, or Finland, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. It's the same shit Turkey had as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's genuinely one of the things that fucked over the Middle East, I think, right? The Middle East has been the center of like a multi-millennial power structure or, or power struggle that goes back like before the ancient Greeks, like before anyone, basically, because it's like it's like literally like the cradle of civilization. It's like the center, you know, what? it's the it's the middle of the East. <laughs> they they why they were already in the East, but they're too middle. They ha they should they should have been more East or 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 more middle, but not Middle East. It's too, too centralized. Mesopotamia also had no defensible land formation, so it's basically impossible to hold. Yeah. Hell yeah, so right. Thank you. Apart from the rule of Aka Muhammad Khan, the Qajar rule is characterized as a century of misrule. The inability of Qajar Iran's government to maintain the country's sovereignty during and immediately after World War I led to the British-directed 1921 Persian coup d'etat and Reza Shah's establishment of the Pahlavi dynasty. Reza Shah became the new prime minister of Iran and was declared the new monarch in 1925. So this is the dynasty that will last until the uh, Iranian revolution. So this is, this, is, this is the point where the West really put their thumb down on Iran and set in motion the happening, the capital H happening. All problems come from Europe. Okay, to be fair, basically since the Mongols, Iran has just been taking L after L after L, right? Okay. In the midst of World War II in June 1941... Well, wait, I want to know a bit about Pahlavi Iran. Um, like, what was, it, what was it like, kind of? Was it relatively progressive? Was it, like, proto-fascist? 
Um, politics. Parliamentary constitutional monarchy. That's it. Not very much here. Human rights. The rulers of the imperial state of Iran employed secret police, torture, and executions to stifle political dissent. Cool. The Pahlavi dynasty has been sometimes described as an imperial dictatorship or one-man rule. According to one... Who? Oh, okay, so... Wikipedia doesn't believe this. History of the use of torture by the Iranian government, abuse of prisoners. Okay, not much information. Whatever. In the midst of World War II, in June 1941, Nazi Germany broke the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and invaded the Soviet Union, Iran's northern neighbor. The Soviets quickly allied themselves with the Allied countries, and in July and August 1941, the British demanded the Iranian government expel all Germans from Iran. Reza Shah refused to expel the Germans, and on the 25th of August, British and Soviets launched a surprise invasion of Iran, and Reza Shah's government quickly surrendered? I didn't know this. They refused to deport the Germans, so we they did a fucking surprise. I didn't know this at all. Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran. Okay. The invasion's strategic purpose was to ensure the safety of Allied supply lines to the USSR, secure Iranian oil fields, limit German influence in Iran because Reza Shah was considered friendly to Nazi Germany, and preempt a possible Axis advance from Turkey. Interesting. I think it's really funny that this is a puppet government orchestrated by the British, and despite that, they were considered friendly to Nazi Germany. Like, that, not that kind of funny? Like, a little bit? Like, eh, maybe not. No, this is before the puppet government? I thought the puppet government was put in place, um, yeah, right here, uh, after the 1921 coup d'etat. Installed, but not really a puppet. Okay, so, the, okay, so the leader, so not much direct control. The puppet was the Shah. I think there are multiple puppets. Okay, so this was more like, we'll, we'll let this leader be in charge, but the later it would be, okay, okay, listen, okay, it happened multiple times, all right? It's a, it's a recurring motif when you're in Iran and you hear the, uh, you hear the, the British imperialism lay motif playing in the, in the distance. Launch a surprise invasion, secure supply line, is a... Following the invasion, Reza Shah abdicated and was replaced by Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Here we go. This guy. God damn the drip, though. Okay. Fuck this guy. However, drippy. During the rest of World War II, Iran became a major conduit for British and American aid to the Soviet Union, and an avenue through which over 100,000 Polish refugees and Polish armed forces fled the Axis advance. Oh, that's nice. At the 1943 Tehran Conference, the Allied Big Three, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, issued the Tehran Declaration to guarantee the post-war independence and boundaries of Iran. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of the war, Soviet troops remained in Iran and established two puppet states in northwestern Iran, namely the People's Government of Azerbaijan and the Republic of Mahabad. This led to the Iran crisis in 1946. We have to remember, it's not just the West, right? Russia, ever, ever since what? Um, Ever since, um, what's the, what's her name? The queen? The queen of Russia? Empress? Catherine, yeah. Ever since Catherine, I feel like Russia basically, like, stepped in to be, to, to join in with the Western powers and being, like, a big imperialist bastard, you know? I feel like they, they made a, a concerted effort to channel that energy. Peter started that? Didn't Catherine really kick it off more? Okay, I get maybe Peter. I don't know that much about that. Tsarina, yeah, okay. One of the first confrontations of the Cold War, which ended after oil concessions were pro which ended after oil concessions were promised to the USSR and Soviet forces withdrew from Iran proper in 1946. God damn, they were bigger bastards than us after this. In the Tehran conference, we promised them independence, and after World War II, the Soviet Union just fucking sat on Iran and was like, yeah, we'll leave if you let us keep your oil, you know? Okay. The two puppet states were soon overthrown, and the oil concessions were later revoked. Hell yeah. Decolonization. In 1951, Mohammad Mossadegh was appointed as the Prime Minister of Pahlavi Iran. After the <clears throat> nationalization of Iran's oil industry, Wee woo wee woo. Uh, 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 uh. Fuck. <laughs> in, in, in every Oval Office equivalent all around the Western world, fucking the lights start flashing. He became enormously popular. He was deposed 
in the 1953 Iranian coup d'etat, an Anglo-American covert operation that marked the first time the United States had participated in the overthrow of a foreign government during the Cold War. Just to clarify that. Yeah. It's, you know, in 1953. So the, the 1953 Iranian coup d'etat is like the big... This is a whole thing. But you can summarize it pretty clearly. We wanted the oil. That's it. They nationalized the oil. We didn't like that. We went in. We did a coup. It's pretty much that simple. It gets more complicated if you read into that. We did a lot of really bad things. Uh, that's the gist of it, though. Eisenhower was briefed on the coup and said, I'm glad we're overthrowing that madman Mossadegh, but I didn't realize he wasn't a communist. Ha! <laughs> Uh, sorry. America didn't want the oil, Britain did. America was worried because he worked with the Communist Party. Oh, okay, so Britain wanted the oil, and we wanted to kill communists. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Uh, very good. The U.S.'s role, yeah. The CIA St. Major General Norman Schwarzkopf Sr. Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf. Hey. What were you doing during World War II? Okay, we're safe. Just making sure. Okay, just making sure. There are plenty of Germans who were born and raised in America, but we're talking about, like, 1950s CIA shit, okay? I'm just making sure. Uh, <laughs> the coup was carried out by the U.S. administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower in a covert action advocated by Secretary of State John Dulles and implemented under the supervision of his brother, Alan Dulles, um, the Director of Central Intelligence. The coup was organized by the CIA and the United Kingdom's MI6, two spy agencies that aided royalists and royalist elements of the Iranian army. Much of the money that was channeled through the pro-Shah Ayatollah Mohammad Babahani, who draw many religious masses to the plot. Ayatollah Kashani had completely turned on Mossadegh and supported the Shah by this point. According to a heavily redacted CIA document released to the National Security Archive, in response to a FOIA request, available documents do not indicate who authorized the CIA to begin planning the operation, but it was almost certainly Eisenhower himself. Thanks, Eisenhower. You fucking fish-eyed fucking mixed bag of a president. During the coup, Roosevelt and Wilbur, representatives of the Eisenhower administration, bribed Iranian government officials, reporters, and businessmen. They also bribed street thugs to support the Shah and oppose Mossadegh. Can you imagine being a CIA dude in 1950s Iran, finding a bunch of like greaser Iranians and like a, who are like, have like those like, like switchblade combs that they're like, like maintaining their pompadours with. And you're like a, what's up dudes? Want to support the Shah? You know, and you hand them some fucking no, in Iran, it would be a scimitar. No. Oh, you're right. Sorry. Switchblade scimitars. It's like two feet long and they like swoosh it and a gigantic scimitar curved comb flips out and they just like two handed brush there. In 2000, James Risen of the New York Times obtained the previously secret CIA version of the coup written by Wilbur and summarized its contents, including the following. In early August, the CIA increased the pressure. Iranian operatives pretending to be communists threatened Muslim leaders with savage punishment if they opposed Mossadegh, seeking to stir anti-communist sentiment in the religious families. Oh, cool, an actual op. In addition, the secret history says the house of at least one prominent Muslim was bombed by CIA agents posing as communists. It does not say whether anyone was hurt in this attack. The agency was intensifying its propaganda campaign. A leading newspaper owner was granted a personal loan of about $45,000 in the belief this would make his organ amenable to our purposes. Jesus. I need to use the restroom very quickly. It's really good to learn about the um, Islamic Golden Age stuff, because you know how like modern racists will say that white people are superior because Western civilization is the most advanced like right now? Which, I mean, for the past 200 and 250 years or so, like that's basically been true in terms of like inventions and scientific development since the... Uh, since the uh, Enlightenment period, we've been on the up and up. We've been the, the primary, like, pushers forward of, of the sort of, you know, at least the technological angle. But the thing is, like, if you went back, like, 1,200 years, 
that would not be the case at all. And if we lived in that time and somebody wanted to form a racial pretext for which race was superior based on their contributions to science or whatever, if you went back a thousand years, it would be like, oh, obviously it must be like the Arabs and the Persians who are the most racially advanced. Look, while the Europeans live in mud huts, you know, uh, they, they're they like it, fucking figuring out evolution and have like fucking Medicare for all, you know? Um, it's just important to understand that depending on where you stop the clock on history, a bunch of different civilizations gets to be like the main character. You know what I mean? If you go back far enough, China is like the undisputed main character, you know? Yeah, just under understanding how much variance there's been in the prominence of, of, of a variety of empires can really help you in these arguments. Okay, uh, somebody recommended a Vox video. Middle East Cold War explained. Uh no, this is this is this is somewhat tangential. We we have to we have to be we have to be disciplined. Okay. So basically, they nationalized the oil industry and we did a coup half because we wanted the oil and half because we thought we saw communists in a bush somewhere, okay? After the coup, the Shah became increasingly autocratic and sultanistic, and Iran entered a decades-long phase of controversially close relations with the United States and some other foreign governments. While the Shah increasingly modernized Iran and claimed to retain it as a fully secular state, arbitrary arrests and torture by a secret police, the Savak, were used for crushing all forms of political opposition. So you guys know how you've seen like, you okay, so you guys know how you've seen the narrative about like, hey, before the Iranian revolution, like, look, it was a totally normal modern country. The Muslims ruined everything. Here's the problem with that, okay? When you see like photos like this taken in pre-revolution Iran, these were usually very wealthy, socially privileged people, oftentimes foreigners, who were part of the elite caste in an autocratic government that was appointed by a coup. Um, this, th this isn't like, this wasn't like Iran broadly. The vast majority of Iran was Muslim. It was led by a nominally secular Shah um, who was like a puppet for Western interests. What we're seeing here isn't an authentic expression of social progressivism in the country, but rather like an imposed and very selective caste of people who get to live as modern Westerners, while the majority of the country doesn't and don't. Um, and ultimately, we are the reasons why um, uh, Islam in Iran is what it is. Because as we're about to find out, when you spend like 40 years di like doing coups and suppressing the religious majority uh, with a dictatorship, you know, eventually if you pull the band back far enough, what if not religious religious extremists are going to be the guys who fight back against you? The revolution was not initially Islamist, though. Yeah, but it certainly fucking ended up that way. We'll get to it. Rahola Khomeini, a radical Muslim cleric, became an active critic of the Shah's far-reaching series of reforms known as the White Revolution. Khomeini publicly denounced the government and was arrested and imprisoned for 18 months. After his release in 64, he refused to apologize and was eventually sent into exile. White Revolution. A far-reaching series of reforms resulting in aggressive modernization in Iran launched in 1963 by the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, which lasted until 79. These reforms resulted in a great redistribution of wealth to Iran's working class, explosive economic growth in subsequent decades, rapid urbanization, and deconstruction of Iran's feudal customs. Well, that all sounds quite nice. The reforms were characterized by high economic growth rates, major investments in infrastructure, substantial growth in per capita wealth, and literacy of Iranians. The economic growth and education advancement arguably paved the way for Shah's military arms buildup and the establishment of Iran as a major geopolitical power in the Middle East. It consisted of several elements. Okay, this gets very... Um, the Shah thought he would outflank leftists with reforms from above. Yeah, I think this might be like a Roosevelt kind of deal where it's like, you know, let's capitulate. In order to legitimize the White Revolution, the Shah called for a national referendum in which 5.6 million people voted for the reforms and 4,000 voted against. I don't know if I believe those numbers. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Like 99.9% .9 in favor. Mm, interesting. All right, let's continue. Due to the 1973 spike in oil prices, the economy of Iran was flooded with foreign currency, which caused inflation. 
By 1974, the economy of Iran was experiencing a double-digit inflation rate, and despite the many large projects to modernize the country, corruption was rampant and caused large amounts of waste. By 1975 and 1976, an economic recession led to an increased unemployment rate, especially among millions of youth who had migrated to the cities of Iran looking for construction jobs during the boom years of the early 70s. By the late 70s, many of these people opposed the Shah's regime and began organizing and joining protests against it. Oh boy. Oh boy. The 1979 Iranian Revolution. Main article. See also, Iranian Revolution, Iran-Iraq War, and Human Rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. The 1979 Revolution, later known as the Islamic Revolution, or The Happening, began in January 1978 with the first major demonstrations against the Shah. After a year of strikes and demonstrations paralyzing the country and its economy, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, that's the Shah, fled to the U.S., and um, Ruhollah Khomeini returned from exile to Tehran in February 1979, forming a new government. After holding a referendum, Iran officially became an Islamic Republic in April of 1979. A second referendum in December 1979 approved a theocratic constitution. The immediate nationwide uprisings against the new government began with the 1797, or sorry, 17, 1979 Kurdish Rebellion and the Khuzestan uprising, uprisings, along with the uprisings in Sistan and Baluchistan and other areas. Over the next several years, these uprisings were subdued violently by the new Islamic government. The new government began purging itself of the non-Islamist political opposition, as well as, uh, look at what the Shah was doing while his country was starving, the most expensive party in history. Yeah, this is a whole... I'm not reading all this. Yeah, he did a very expensive party. I remember this. I read that in a little bit. As well as those Islamists were not considered radical enough. Although both nationalists and Marxists had initially joined with Islamists to overthrow the Shah. Oh no, 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 no. Don't ally with Islamic extremists. Don't ally with any kind of religious extremists. They are not your allies in the long run. Tens of thousands were executed by the new regime afterwards. Following Khomeini's order to pur purge the new government of any remaining officials still loyal to the exiled Shah, many former ministers and officials in the Shah's government, including former Prime Minister Amir Abbas um, Hoveda, were executed. On the 4th of November, 1979, after the United States' refusal for the extradition of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi to the new government, a group of Muslim students seized the United States Embassy and took the embassy with 52 personnel and citizens hostage. Oh god, this thing. Attempts by the Jimmy Carter administration to negotiate for the release of the hostages and a failed rescue attempt helped with the falling popularity of Carter among U.S. citizens and pushed him out of presidential office and brought Ronald Reagan to power. It all fits into place. On Jimmy Carter's final day in office, the last hostages were finally set free due to the Algiers Accords. Mohammed Reza Pahlavi left the United States for Egypt, where he died, from com uh, died of complications from cancer only months later on the 27th of July, 1980. Yeah, I can't believe the Iranians gave us Reagan. The cultural, re that's not true. The cultural revolution began in 1980 with an initial closure of universities for three years in order to perform an inspection and cleanup in the cultural policy of the education and training system. Then Iraq invaded. The Western Iranian province of Khuzestan initiating the Iran-Iraq war. Although the forces of Saddam Hussein, he really has fought in a lot of wars, hasn't he? Although the forces of Saddam Hussein made several early advances, by mid-1982, the Iranian forces successfully managed to drive the Iraqi army back into Iraq. In July 1982, with Iraq thrown on the defensive, the regime of Iran decided to invade Iraq and conducted countless offenses to conquer Iraqi territory and capture cities such as Basra. The war continued until 1988, when the Iraqi army defeated the Iranian forces inside Iraq and pushed the remaining Iranian troops back across the border. Subsequently. Khomeini accepted a truce mediated by the United Nations. The total Iranian casualties in the war were estimated to be around 150,000 killed in action, 60,000 missing in action, and 11,000 to 16,000 civilians killed. Following the Iran-Iraq War in 1989, yes, in this war, uh, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons, yeah, which we gave him. <laughs> uh... American support for Ba'athist Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War, in which it fought against post-revolutionary Iran, included several billion dollars worth of economic aid, the sale of dual-use technology, non-U.S. origin weaponry. 
you guys know the meme about how, like, when you fund a terrorist group to destabilize the regime that you funded to dis destabilize the regime that you funded to destabilize the regime that you fund. This is it right here. This, this is literally like we did a coup in Iran to support like uh, the oil interests, and then they had a revolution. So then we supported Iraq to invade iran and then later we had the fucking gulf war and then we and then we did that and then we did the iraq war and then the, the coup to the coup to the coup to the coup the u.s government support for iraq was not a secret and was frequently discussed in open sessions of the senate and house of representatives american views towards iraq were not enthusiastically supportive in its conflict with iran and activity and assistance was largely to prevent an iranian victory this was encapsulated by henry kissinger when he remarked it's a pity they both can't lose Thanks, Kissinger. Thank you for your input on the matter. You have like, uh, you have like the the congressional debates, and meanwhile, in like the corner, the corner of like the house, uh, you know, the, the the house hall, there's just like this sulfuric pit where Kissinger is like sitting at like a little desk made of like I don't know human bone, occasionally chiming in. Uh, Iraq's use of chemical weapons. Iran suffered more than 50,000 casualties from Iraq's use of several chemical weapons. Assistance in developing chemical weapons were obtained from firms in many countries, including the United States, West Germany, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and France. A report stated that Dutch, Australian, Italian, French, and both West and East German companies were involved in the export of raw materials to Iraqi chemical weapons factories. Declassified CIA documents show that the U.S. was providing reconnaissance intelligence to Iraq, which was then used to launch chemical weapon attacks on Iranian troops, and that the CIA fully knew the chemical weapons would be deployed and sarin and cyclosarin attacks followed. Where are the bad guys? Following the Iran-Iraq war, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani and his administration concentrated on a pragmatic pro-business policy of rebuilding and strengthening the economy without making any dramatic break with the ideology of the revolution. In 1997, Rafsanji was succeeded by moderate reformist Mohammed Khatami, whose government attempted unsuccessfully to make the country more free and democratic. The 2005 presidential election brought conservative populist candidate Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to power. By the time of the 2009 Iran presidential election, the Interior Ministry announced incumbent President Ahmadinejad had won 62.63% of the vote, while Mir Hossein Mosavi had come in second place with 33.75%. The election results were widely disputed and resulted in widespread prote protests, both within Iran and in major cities outside the country, and the creation of the Iranian Green Movement. Hassan Rouhani was elected as the president uh, on the 15th of June 2013, defeating Mohammed Bakir Ghalibaf uh, 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 and four other candidates. The electoral victory of Rouhani relatively improved the relations of Iran with other countries. In 19, or sorry, in 2017 to 2018, Iranian protests swept across the country against its government and its longtime supreme leader in response to the economic and political situation. The scale of protests throughout the country and the number of people participating were significant. It was formally confirmed that thousands of protesters were arrested. Thousands were killed, not just arrested. Uh, shut down. Bloodiest government crackdown of protesters in the history of the Islamic Republic. Oh, and then Trump uh, murked Soleimani. Three days after, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps launched a retaliatory attack on U.S. forces and by accident shot down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752, killing 176 civilians and leading to nationwide protests. And then we have the current protests. Oh, I forgot about that bit. I think I think that actually was an accident. I, I don't. I why would they shoot down a Ukrainian flight? I think they were just twitchy. Yeah, that was that was just them. That was just a fuck up, you know. Okay. Wow, well, we sure learned some stuff. So to be clear, and we're going to read more now on the history of the Islamic, we're going to learn about the, the Iranian Revolution. Basically, like, listen, it's a really complicated history, but the basic gist of it is this, okay? Iran was subject to Western imperialism for a long time, and when that tension eventually broke, it left a power vacuum. And initially, any alternative to the Shah seemed preferable. Uh, you know, Muslim extremists, populists, Marxists, uh, nationalists, uh, uh, you know, they, they, all, they all struggled to fill the void. And at the end of the fighting, you know, a after many, many killings, it was the Muslim extremists who won. Um, but the only reason that power vacuum existed 
was because of an unjust, undemocratic, and authoritarian coup on our part. We, we ceded the instability that then led to the conditions which emerged following the Shah's removal. You know, we did that. Stolen revolution in Iran 1979. Yeah, it's important to understand the government of Iran is militantly and aggressively Islamic, but the people of Iran are not. The, the government of Iran is not that popular with the people of Iran. The people of Iran are, generally speaking, more uh, secular, more progressive, and more reformist than the government. The government is disproportionately religiously extremist. That doesn't mean they're all like fucking Bernie Kratz over there or anything. It just means that the, the, the government is worse than what the people would want if they were given authentic democratic uh, representation. There are a lot of secular people in Iran. Yeah. Listen to this. According to this, look at this. This is from 2020. According to a new poll, four decades after the establishment of the Islamic regime, only 32% of the population consider themselves Shia Muslims. This is from a, like, theocratic authoritarian Shia Muslim government, the only one in the world. A new poll asked 50,000 Iranian participants their attitude towards religion. 78% of Iranians believe in God, but only 26% of them believe in the coming of the Messiah, which is one of the main beliefs of the Twelver Shiites. While only 32% of Iranians consider themselves Shia Muslims, they have claimed, 9% uh, have claimed to be atheists, and 22% do not align with any religion. I think this is a comparable number of atheist and agnostic people to the United States. Yet possibly even less religious. Well, hold on. How many people in U.S. are secular? About 3 in 10. So 3 in 10 for both. 9% plus 22% do not align with any religion or are atheists in Iran, and 3 in 10 Americans are religiously unaffiliated. This is what I mean, like, it, Iran, the population of Iran is not the government of Iran, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's like, think of Donald Trump, right? Imagine if Donald Trump had succeeded on January 6th and immediately created, like, a theocratic, like, Christian nationalist government, you know? America, the country, might have been, like, Christian fascist at that point, but America would still be full of, like, non-Christian fascist people. In fact, the Christian fascist group would probably be a minority, like a third of the country, maybe. Just keep that in mind, you know? 37% of Iranians drink alcohol regularly or occasionally, despite its prohibition. 73% of the population disagree with the compulsory hijab, while 58% don't believe in hijabs at all. The poll was conducted by an anti-regime activist. True, but... Is that bad? I think the anti-regime activists are in the right here. I guess, I mean, that is a bias, sure, but what do Iranians tend to drink? Well, well, they're not allowed to drink. I don't know what they, I don't know what they, they have a preference for. Isn't Iran aligned with Russia? The Iranian government is more aligned with Russia than they are with us, but Iran and Russia aren't like butt buddies or anything like that. Um, they, it's, it's, it's like a broader anti-American thing. The Iranian government, like, the number one political position of the Iranian government is fuck America. <laughs> um, they are American diabolism, which, to be fair, they've earned it. We did fuck them up. Um, but yeah, the, 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 Iranian, the Iranian government, like, the supreme leader will wake up in the morning, stub his toe, and then go on national television to explain how American devils and their Jewish uh, puppet masters have orchestrated an attack on, like, Muslim autonomy by moving the, the wall in the, the position that his toe occupied, you know? Like, he, it, 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 yeah, like that, that's the current nature of the, of the Iranian government. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. But, but the people of Iran, I've heard many good things of the, the people of Iran. Check out this video, it's on Jews in Iran, uh, but also mentions a lot of general history. Jews leaving Iran after revolution. Well, I know a lot about that. Um, the exodus of the Iranian Jews, because they went to where I live, uh, lived, Beverly Hills. Um, after the Iranian revolution, when the Muslim extremists took over, you'll never guess which religious minority suddenly realized they weren't safe there anymore. The migration of Persian Jews after the Iranian revolution is mostly attributed to fear of religious persecution, economic hardships, insecurity. If I control F Beverly Hills, do you think... From Babylonia to Beverly Hills, the Exodus of Iran's Jews documentary. Right down there.
They're everywhere over there. And they have great food. Which means that I grew up eating uh, Iranian food. Iranian dude likely speaking for the silent majority there. What are we looking at? Man uses colorful language to get the message across to the Iranian clerical regime, translation subtitles included. This is from the modern protests. Man, yes, sorry, that I'm as you want. A hundred day. Kuta, Kuta, Fikr, but Koden. Shama, Mother Jinda Hoye Koskish. Motvajina should in K. Islam, Chijulivar de Iron Shod. Islam, Fikar did Maselanun Osman Bud, Kudum Koskishi Bud. با شکلات و شیرینی و گل اومد دم مرز گفت ببخشید مزاحم میشم این یه بروشور جدید Sorry, this feels a bit narrativized for my taste. I'm not sure if I would even disagree with what he's saying, but I don't think we're at the part of this yet where we're rah-rahing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it might also be that it's the Iranian counterpart to the American guy in a car with sunglasses. Many Iranians are anti-Islam. Well, yeah, many Americans are like resent like the Christian like Christian fascist minority. Um, it makes sense. Yeah, I can't handle slander of Allah. True. Khomeini wrote a letter to Gorbachev to convert him to Islam. That is incredibly funny. This is the kind of earnestness that occasionally makes religious leaders very funny. The idea of writing a letter to Mikhail Gorbachev to try to like, hey, can you like praise Allah? You know, that's very, very, very fucking funny. He invited Gorbachev to consider Islam as an alternative to communist ideology. He, communism was dissolving and he was like, have you considered Islam? Rotola Khomeini wrote to Mikhail Gorbachev on the 3rd of January 1989. On the 7th of January, Khomeini's representatives, Abdullah Javadi Amoli and Mohammed Javad Larijani and Marzi Harichi went to Moscow to officially deliver the letter. Soviet officials met the Iranian delegation at the airport. They had a delegation! Gorbachev then met with the Iranian representatives for approximately two hours, where an interpreter translated the letter for Mikhail Gorbachev and his colleagues. When some, of, when some part of the letter was unclear, the interpreter asked the Iranian delegation to clarify. Gorbachev listened politely and took notes on its contents. The letter's contents were kept secret, and so Soviet officials did not know it was an invitation to consider Islam. In the letter, Khomeini congratulated Gorbachev for his bravery in dealing with the modern world and his reconstruction of Soviet principles. He suggested Islam as an alternative to communist ideology and recommended Muslim philosophers such as Ibn Arabi, Avicenna, and Al-Farabi. The letter included a prediction about the end of Marxism and the collapse of communism. Khomeini stated, Mr. Gorbachev, it is clear to everyone that from now on, communism will only have to be found in the museums of world political history. Ouch. For Marxism cannot meet any of the real needs of mankind. Marxism is a materialistic ideology, and materialism cannot bring humanity out of the crisis caused by a lack of belief in spirituality, the prime affliction of the human society in the East and West alike. Khomeini warned Gorbachev against falling into the arms of Western capitalism. Khomeini further added in the letter that the main problem confronting your country is not of private ownership, freedom, and economy. Your problem is absence in the true faith of God. <laughs> God. Yeah, homie took his shot, for sure, for sure. This is really complicated. Let's learn a little bit about the Supreme Leader. Found you. This is our main guy right now. This is the absolute Supreme Leader. I mean, he's literally called the Supreme Leader. This is our guy. This is the guy. A 12er Shia Marha and the second and current Supreme Leader of Iran in office since 1989. He was also the third president of Iran. Khomeini is the longest-serving head of state in the Middle East, as well as the long, uh, second longest-serving Iranian leader of the last century, after the Shah. According to his official website, Khomeini was arrested six times before being sent into exile for three years during the Shah's reign. After the Iranian Revolution, he was the target of an assent attempted assassination in June 1981 that paralyzed his right arm. I didn't know that. That's not Khomeini, no, this is Khomeini. Khomeini was one of Iran's leaders during the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, and develop close ties with the now powerful Revolutionary Guard who he controls, and whose commanders are elected and dismissed by him. The Revolutionary Guards have been deployed to suppress opposition to him. He served as the, uh, as the uh, 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 third president of Iran from 81 to 89, while being a, fir a close ally of the first supreme leader, Khomeini. After his, uh, or before his death, Khomeini had a disagreement with the heir he had chosen, 
Hussein Ali Montazeri, so there was no agreed-on successor when Khomeini died. The Assembly of Experts elected Khomeini as the next Supreme Leader uh, on the 4th of June, 1989, at age 50. Man's old. As Supreme Leader, Khomeini is the most powerful political authority in the Islamic Republic, head of state of Iran, commander-in-chief of its armed forces, can do literally anything that he wants, no matter what. There have been major protests during his reign, including the 1994 Kazvin protest, the 1999 Iranian student protest, the 2009 Iranian presidential protest, the 2011-2012 Iranian protest, 2017-2018 Iranian protest, 2018-2019-2020, what the fuck is this? This is just an infinite recurring chain of protest. 2017 to 2018, 2018 to 2019, 2019 to 2020. Just ha just consolidate this into the ongoing fucking protests. Oh, sure, President Sunday. Journalists, bloggers, and other individuals have been put on trial in Iran for the charge of insulting the Supreme Leader, often in conjunction with blasphemy charges. Their sentences have included lashing and jail time. Some have died in custody. Regarding the nuclear program of Iran, Khamenei issued a fatwa in 2003 forbidding the production, stockpiling, and use of all kinds of weapons of mass destruction. I wonder how many of these protests liberals had to denounce because they impeded traffic. Oh, I hope none of these protests impeded traffic. This is a very cursed image. Doesn't he, doesn't he just look like he's participating in the Cambodian genocide here? I don't know. I guess he couldn't because he has glasses. Second of eight children. As Supreme Leader, Khamenei moved to a house in central Tehran on Palestine Street. Wow. Occupation of Palestine knows no bounds. A compound grew around it that now contains around 50 buildings. Around 500 people are employed at this Beit Rabari compound, many recruited from the military and security services. He's got a fucking campus. According to Mehdi Kalaji, an Iran expert at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Khamenei has a decent life without it being luxurious. Robert Tate of the Daily Telegraph commented that he is renowned for a Spartan lifestyle. Dexter Filkins describes Khamenei as presenting himself as an ascetic, dressing and eating simply. In an interview with a woman's magazine, his wife declared that we do not have decorations in the usual sense. Years ago, we freed ourselves from those things. I don't believe you. On the other hand, Mother Nature Network claims Khamenei has been seen riding around in a BMW car and published a picture of him exiting one. In a 2011 report in the Daily Telegraph, defectors from Iran claimed Khamenei has a considerable appetite of caviar and trout, a stable of 100 horses, collects items such as pipes, and reputedly 170 antique walking sticks, and has a private court stretching over six palaces. So he's a true believer? I Everything that I've ever read about him gives me the impression that Khamenei is sincerely a Muslim, you know? Like, not that that justifies anything. Like, to put it, to put it in comparison, like, I think Khamenei actually is a Muslim. The Saudi royal family, I don't think that at all. I think that if the Saudi royal family could get away with it without inciting a revolution, I think they would replace, like, Mecca with, like, a sports stadium or maybe, like, a big pinball arcade or something. I don't, yeah, I, I don't think they give a fuck about anything other than their money. I mean, obviously, the Saudi royal family encompasses a ton of people, so I'm, you know, I'm kind of generalizing, but broadly, yeah. The Pope is also a true believer? Well, I hope the Pope is a true believer, yeah. The critical distinction with the Pope is that unlike the Saudi royal family and the, uh, the Supreme Leader, the Pope doesn't really have any direct governmental authority outside of control over the Vatican, which is, you know, it's not really a country. Um, you know, he, he's, he's principally a religious authority, whereas uh, the Saudi royal family and the Supreme Leader are principally uh, governmental authorities. Yeah, the Vatican's a micro -state. The Vatican's, it's not a real country. It's not, it's not a real country. It's not a real country. Fatwa against nuclear weapons. Fuck yeah, dude. Me too. I also declare a fatwa against nuclear weapons. In 2002, he ruled that human stem cell research was permissible under Islam, with the condition that it be used to create only whole parts as opposed to a whole human. Ah, okay. So you can, you can do stem cell research as long as you don't create a homunculus. That seems reasonable. A six-month investigation by Reuters has said that Khamenei controls a financial empire worth approximately $95 billion that is not overseen by the Iranian parliament, a figure much larger than the estimated wealth of the late Shah of Iran. According to the Reuters investigation, Khamenei uses the assets of a company called Headquarters for executing the order of the Imam, or Sitad in Farsi, in order to increase his grip on power. Reuters found no evidence Khamenei is tapping Sitad to enrich himself, but did find he used Sitad's funds, which rival the holdings of the Shah, for political expedience. Interesting. This seems complicated. 
Do you think he has a Steam account? Oh, I'm sure he's played TF2. Yeah. Beliefs about the U.S. and its foreign policy. The U.S. and Iran have had no formal diplomatic relations since the Iran hostage crisis. Speeches by Khamenei regularly mention the principle of resolute opposition to the United States. He once told reformist President Mohammed Khatami that we need the U.S. as an enemy. Yep. Uh, the... Um, the supreme leader uh, basically, it, he does the same thing that Putin does, whereby reframing all internal problems as like a product of antagonism towards the West, they can justify their authoritarianism. They can point out a real problem and say like, okay, so now that we agree this problem exists, like I get to be supreme leader now. Like, yeah, if the US did not exist, we'd have to invent them. It's a very common strategy for autocrats to identify like, real external enemies and then use them as a perpetual omnipresent force uh that they can use to justify basically anything we've done it they've done it but he really likes doing it <laughs> he, he does it quite a lot he's also quite anti-semitic if i remember correctly um he's, he said some wacky stuff you know in march 2020 Kameni warned against a U.S. effort, a, a U.S. offer of aid to fight covid 19 on the grounds that it could be a way to hurt iran by further spreading the disease he also suggested the U.S. had developed a special variety of the virus based on Iranian genetic information they have gathered, although he provided no evidence for the theory. And, just to hit the tanky stuff home, in March 2020, he accused the U.S. of creating the conflict surrounding the Russo-Ukraine war. He's been criticized for making threats against Israel and anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric. I'll give it a look. You gotta browse Wikipedia if you want to learn a bunch of stuff quickly, President Sunday. You use Wikipedia, then you iterate. You delve further in with more specific sources. Wants to annihilate Israel. Says he wants to glass Israel. Holocaust denial. Oh no. During a morning speech in 2014, marking the Persian New Year, Khamenei called into question the Holocaust. He said that the Holocaust is an event whose reality is uncertain, and if it has happened, it's uncertain how it has happened. Additionally, he commented that no one in European countries dares to speak about the Holocaust um, and said that in the West, speaking about the Holocaust and expressing doubts about it is considered to be a great sin. Hmm. On Holocaust Memorial Day, January 27th, 2016, Kameni posted a Holocaust-denying video on his official website. In the video, lasting about three minutes, the video features images of Holocaust deniers Roger Garodi, Robert Farrison, and David Irving in a series of tweets in mid-December 2019, he praised Garotti. In the fight he engaged in against Zionists is a hashtag divine duty for all those who respect the hashtag truth. This guy got arrested for Holocaust denial. He converted to Islam in 1982. Oh, wait, hold on. French philosopher and communist author who converted to Islam in 82 in 88, convicted and fined for Holocaust denial under French law for claiming the death of 6 million Jews the myth. Hmm. Oh, God. Oh, wait. This was in, in, in 1982. Do you think uh, 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 Khamenei got him as well? And it was like, oh, we can get Gorbachev, maybe. Hmm. A leading polemicist within the French Communist Party. Hmm. Oh, my God. He was a Christian. Then he reconverted to Catholicism became a prominent cleric, and then eventually converted to Islam? Okay, this guy's... He's like a Maggie, MAGA tanky for Allah? Yeah, I guess he is. Fuck. Yeah, flip-flopping. Jesus. He is all over the place. Will he convert to Judaism next? Is he still alive? No, he died in 2012. What am I supposed to look at here? President Sunday? This is a very long Wikipedia article. I'm getting near the end of stream anyhow. There was a lot of other stuff that I wanted to learn about. Like Kurdish separatism, the Kurds, the Kurds, the Kurds are like an ethnic minority that have been historically mistreated, that have uh, vied for independence for a very long time. Um, the stolen revolution on how the Iranian revolution could have been cool, but then like the fucking extremists took over. Just stream harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Guys, I think it's time. Since you looked at Aztec Mesoamerican architecture, it'd be cool if you checked out Iranian architecture. You know what? Sure. I do think it's kind of cool that Allah gives artists visions from the great ether and compels them to make, like, the dopest tiling in the known universe. It's really cool of Allah to do that, you know? Wow. This is before the Parthenian... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why haven't I ever seen this before? This is before the Parthenian period. 
we always see like uh, like ancient Greek ruins. Look at this. This was from the BC times, from 3rd to 1st century BCE. Look at this. Ryan Castle. This was under the um, Seleucids. Dope. God damn. God damn. Panoramic view of the Naqsh i Rustam. This site contains the tombs of four Achaemenid kings, including those of Darius I and Xerxes. Can you fucking imagine? Oh. Can you imagine making your way through the goddamn mountains of Iran and you just see these fucking tomb obelisks built into the side of the mountain? Jesus Christ. The actual Xerxes was so much cooler than the depiction in that atrocious 300 movie. Bosch, the Parthenon was like 400 BCE. This way after that. It said 300 to 100 BCE. People here are building, people here are trying to compete. I really like these castles. Sand castles? Yeah, they are. they're just the coolest sand castles, like, ever, basically. Yeah, if you look up ancient Persian architecture, there's a lot of stuff still around. That's dope. Yeah, I don't know anything about Xerxes outside of the fucking 300 movie, where they made the gay Spartans straight gigachads, and they made the, 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 the king of Persia, the emperor of Persia, like a big, tall, gay bottom or whatever. Um, interesting. I'm going to much of Xerxes' bad reputation is due to propaganda by Alexander the Great, who had him vilified. The modern historian Richard Soma regards the portrayal of Xerxes as more nuanced and tragic in the work of contemporary Greek historian Herodotus. Spontaneous information. Wacky. The Achaemenid Empire actually controlled almost half the world's population at the time, more than any empire since. So, like, proportionally, the Achaemenid Empire holds the record on, like, the highest proportion of humanity ever contained, the first Persian Empire. That's dope. I mean, it was like two and a half thousand years ago in the cradle of humanity by the Mediterranean, so that does make sense. Yeah, the contemporarily the largest empire in history, spanning a total of 5.5 million square kilometers. Reconstruction of the Palace of Darius at Susa. God damn. Lie on a decorative panel. Darius the First Palace. Golden Bull. They had freedom of religion. Yeah, in a lot of ways, the... Um, in a lot of ways, the um, uh, the Persian Empire was quite a bit more progressive than the uh, than the Greeks who conquered them. I mean, the the Spartans had slaves. Not sorry, not to conquer the Spartans didn't conquer them. You know, I mean, look at anything in Ishfahan. What do you mean? This is what a Zoroastrian temple looks like. It looks nice. I like the eagle. Love this pathologic shit. Is there any Babylonian architecture left? Seems like it. I think this is a recreation. I don't think they moved this entire facade. Would it, it would have been here in ancient Babylon, like a like a like a citadel. It's difficult to tell with recreations because sometimes like the shit is totally made up, right? Like this, for example. Like I think like this is totally made up. I don't I don't believe this for a fucking second. Not because it would have been impossible to build, but because like the the idea of like constructing something like this. No, it's real with the bridges radiating out like this. Okay, wait, I could be totally wrong. Hold on. What is this meant to be? The Hanging Gardens? But we don't know what the Hanging Gardens look like. Don't, don't, aren't, aren't there conflicting historical accounts? I mean, look, if you Google Babylon, like, here's a photo that comes up. The farther back you go in history, the more, the more we have stories of what things looked like. Yeah, you can Google Babylon Hanging Gardens, but all you're going to get are 3D renders and, um, and drawings, but but they all differ. They all look different. We 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 just have like like we have some of them that look more manageable, like this one from Nat Geo, which definitely looks like something that could be done. You know, like that looks sort of. And then you have like colossal mega fortresses. Who knows? Imagine if it sucked. Yeah, true. Okay, wait. I'm just delaying. I'm super hungry. And we learned a lot of stuff today. Okay? I gotta go. I gotta stream tomorrow. I gotta go. I gotta pick up. I gotta pick up the, um, the, um, the fans. Uh, so I can finally finish building my computer. Yeah. We learned a lot of stuff today. We learned about the golden age of Islam. We learned about a little bit, admittedly. About the modern situation in Iran. Uh, we learned about um, the Aztecs. 
Um, we learned about the Incans. We didn't really learn about the Mayans, but they're cool too. Okay? We learned lots of stuff. And if we keep doing these every once in a while, eventually we'll know everything. That's the goal. I love you guys very much. You're beautiful people. Take care. And I'm going to send you off to...